Hey folks, it's Miss Sinclair for AP World History Modern. Today we are finishing up our Unit 5 lectures on revolutions. We have talked about political revolutions, we've talked about the Industrial Revolution, and we're finishing up the day by returning to the Americas. And we'll, So we'll be looking at nation building in the Americas. For your bell work, I want you to think back and describe one Latin American revolution. What we will be talking about today aligns with AP topic 5.8. So this topic looks at the reactions to the industrial economy. So I would like you to explain the causes and effects of calls for changes in industrial societies between 1750 and 1900. Remember that causation is one of those AP historical thinking skills that I want you to be able to master. So let's do a little bit of thinking back. It's been a while since we talked about Latin America. So who was Benito Juarez and what was La Reforma? You can look in your notes if you need to. You don't need to write this down anywhere, but I just want you to sort of get thinking, maybe jot down a couple notes of what do you remember about our Latin American revolutions? Okay, let's get started. So today we're gonna to be talking about the Americas in general. That is going to include North America, Anglo America, as well as Latin America. So one of the things that we see emerging in the 19th century are these personalist leaders. So a couple things to keep in mind. First, the Americas are our first colonies to become independent. Makes sense, they're our first regions to be colonized. We're gonna spend a lot of next unit talking about how Europe is going to be colonizing Africa and parts of Asia. And so their revolutions and their attempts at independence aren't going to come until the 20th century. So you sort of have two waves of colonization and thus two waves of independence. Your first wave of colonization is going to be in the 16th century and your first wave of independence will be in the 18th and 19th centuries. So we're going to be looking at the way these new nations which are completely unique. And in many ways, they're going to be very distinct from what we see in Africa and Asia. How these new nations grapple with self-governance. One of the things that's going to make our states in the Americas so distinctly different from colonies in Africa and Asia is going to be the population. Because of the dramatic population loss due to disease um, and um, violence with our first wave of conquistadors, you have these nations have been repopulated by descendants of Europeans, by people of mixed race, by African slaves. And so in Africa and Asia, the independence movements will have to grapple with historical power dynamics, ethnic rivalries. These regions are already going to be populated and will remain populated despite European governance. In the Americas, however, the native populations were decimated and the land was predominantly repopulated by Europeans, by migrants, either victims of forced migration or voluntary migration. So keep that in mind. That's our context here. As these new nations begin to grapple with power and self-governance and how to govern their own population and how to take their place on the global stage, you see the rise of these personalist leaders. So a personalist leader is a political leader who relies on their charisma 
and their ability to direct citizens outside of the law. So a great example of this in um, South America would be Jose Antonio Pais of Venezuela. He was born poor, uneducated, but he's strong, he's smart, he's brave, and he's gonna be an effective guerrilla leader fighting against the Spanish, and it will help him to build a powerful political base. Pais is going to really dislike any limits on presidential power. So he's not a fan of any of these constitutions that try to prevent a single executive from having absolute power, right? And that's the whole point of a constitution is to keep power distributed. Simon Bolivar wanted a pan-American state in South America, right? Kind of like the U.S., so you'd have like the United States of North America and then you'd have like the United States of South America where under one government you would have Venezuela, Colombia, um, Peru, Ecuador. Pais doesn't want this. He wants power for himself. He doesn't want to give up any power. Another example of a personalist leader is going to be Andrew Jackson in the United States. Born poor in Tennessee, self-made man, military hero, messy personal life. He's extremely popular among frontier residents, urban workers, and small farmers. He's brave, he's individualistic, and he will challenge authority. Right, so here's, here's the main idea about these personalist leaders, is they are coming from the outside, right? They um, are not part of the establishment, if imagine the quotation marks around that word, they're not coming from position, um, traditional sources of power. They're not born into wealth. They're not born into power. They work their way up, and this is going to make them very appealing to the masses. So that means when these individuals disobey the law, ignore the constitution, they get a pass because the masses tend to like them even if what they're doing is technically illegal. Great example for Andrew Jackson. He is going to kick the Cherokee out of Georgia. It's known as the Trail of Tears. He's gonna send them to a reservation in Oklahoma where thousands will die. It's a devastating loss of culture and identity. And the Cherokee Nation is going to sue. They're going to sue the Jackson administration all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court under John Marshall, yes, um, is going to side with the Cherokee Nation. They're going to say, yeah, what the Jackson administration is doing is in fact illegal. You can't just, you know, kick people off their land. One of the whole points of a um, constitution, especially from the point of view of many of our Enlightenment philosophers, Locke. Rousseau, Smith, is to protect private property. So the fact that the government is stripping private property away from the Cherokee is against not only against the Constitution, but against the very principles that it's founded on. So the Supreme Court says to President Jackson, stop that. You can't do that. Andrew Jackson's response is, well, that's a nice opinion. Supreme Court... Uh, Justice Marshall has, let's see him enforce it, right? He's basically going to ignore the Supreme Court's decision and keep doing what he does. One of the other things we see our new states having to grapple with is regionalism. So regionalism is a vocabulary word all the way from human geo. If you remember, regionalism simply means you are more loyal to your region than your nation. Now, this might be you view yourself first as a Virginian instead of an American. Or it might be you view yourself first as Cherokee. Um, or, you know, whatever it might be, a Tucsonan. The reason is you are more loyal to a smaller group than your new government. This new state has been established. The fact of the matter is the national governments are weaker than the colonial governments had been. And 
all attempts at multi-state federations in South America failed. The Gran Colombia, um, or the um, sort of pan-South American vision of Simon Bolivar, Bolivar will crumble. Instead, you're going to end up um, with multiple states. In the U.S., regionalism will in fact lead to the Civil War. You have the North, you have the South, and you have the West. Your teachers next year in APUSH will spend a lot of time going over this, but about how these different regions had different strengths, different weaknesses, and thus ultimately different goals of where they thought the nation should go. The North is going to be predominantly industrial, whereas the South will be predominantly agrarian. And the question is, what will the West be? Now, we're going to avoid the debate as to the cause of the Civil War. Um, next year in APUSH, you will read um, many different historians and their interpretations of the Civil War. The um, no topic is more debated in American history than the Civil War. In the same way that in modern history, no topic is more debated than the causes of World War I. On an international scale, we see foreign interventions and regional wars. So as these new states are trying to formalize their existence, that means they have to determine their, nat their national borders, um, they have to control access to their natural resources, and control their own markets. Even after independence, Europe keeps on trying to intervene to take control of the natural resources in the Americas, to buy up oil and mines, to try and have a monopoly on the market. We see that the United States, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile will all go to war against their neighbors and succeed, right? U.S. v. Mexico. Um, Brazil uh, against like Uruguay, um, Argentina against Uruguay, um, Chile against Argentina. So it's going to make US, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile really regional powers. The US will in fact go to war against the UK with in the War of 1812, and then the US will go to war against Spain in 1898. We also see the U.S. involvement on an international scale. So the Monroe Doctrine will come out in 1823, and it's essentially a hands-off policy. So President Monroe will issue this doctrine, this document, that says, hey, Europe, the Western Hemisphere is independent. You keep your hands off of all of the Americas or else. To which Europe says, mm, okay, that's cute. Like, all right, America, like United States, like you're, you're adorable. But the Monroe Doctrine is backed up by Britain. They say, yes, we support the Monroe Doctrine. And if you go against it, you have to mess with us as well. And Britain's a much more powerful state. And so the Monroe Doctrine is pr primarily honored. So why wouldn't Britain want other countries involved? Well, the other countries who might be intervening in South America, in the Americas, would be their rivals, right? They already have close trade relationships with Canada and the United States, and they are building up close trade relationships with Latin America. They don't want their traditional European rivals taking control of any of that region. We see American industries seeking new markets and new materials after the American Civil War, which ends in 1865. And one of the places they're going to seek this is in Latin America. So you're going to see the creation of these sort of banana republics, um, not the clothing store, but places where American industrialists will go down and take control of resources, um, will overthrow governments to keep a monopoly on agriculture, and in fact, it will get to the point where the U.S. wants to build a canal 
between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, and the place to do it is Panama. However, the territory of Panama is in fact part of the state of Colombia. So the U.S. will back an independence movement in Panama, and the part of the agreement is if you we help you get your independence, you let us build a canal, and also we own the canal, and it works. Okay, but what about the indigenous peoples? What about all of the native peoples still living in the Americas? Well, the relationship with indigenous populations will be shaped by both diplomacy and war. The Spanish, Portuguese, and British colonial governments had all restricted the expansion of settlements into territories occupied by indigenous populations. So although these European colonizers brought such death and destruction to the indigenous populations, they were ultimately a shield between the surviving native peoples and their new colonies. One of the reasons that will motivate all of our indig- um, all of our new states to become independent is this desire to expand and the frustration of settlers that they have been told no by their European governments. So with the creation of new nations, we see that settlers will start to expand into territories occupied and possessed by indigenous peoples. The Amerindians were a military challenge to the new governments, but by 1890, all of our indigenous populations have been really defeated by the new governments. Indigenous peoples were not considered citizens, so they were not protected by any of the rights in these lofty Enlightenment constitutions put forth in any of these new states. So the indigenous populations would be killed or forced into uninhabitable areas, either reservations um, or mountainous regions in South America and Central America. So in the U.S., we see that settlers expand into territories that had been protected. In the 1830s, you have the Indian Removal Act that is the Trail of Tears, like I mentioned, under Andrew Jackson. And then after the Civil War, you have what's known as the Indian Wars. As settlers really begin to expand into the Great Plains, we see the Plains Indians not giving up their way of life or their land very easily, understandably. This hadn't been an issue before because of infrastructure. The railroads will open up the West in a whole new way and um, will allow people to expand into these regions. In South America, indigenous peoples in Argentina and Chile will see a similar trajectory as the United States. Attempts at adaptation to the new governments, resistance to the new governments, and eventually defeat. So natives herded cattle and kept control of land until the 1860s when the governments will really go on the offensive. So in South America, in Argentina and Chile, they are going to do some, the governments will treat Native Americans in a similar way that they will have be, be treated in the United States and Canada. In Mexico, the Maya people of the Yucatan Peninsula will rebel. They'll fight back. And so this is known as the caste war. Think caste like in India. So this is a rebellion of the Maya people against the government of Mexico in 1847 that nearly returns the Yucatan Peninsula to Maya rule. Some Maya rebels will retreat to unoccupied territories where they will hold out until 1901. In general, we see a lot of social changes. 
In Chile, Argentina, and the U.S., the government will justify military com- campaigns by demonizing Native peoples. Lots of racism with Native populations portrayed as cruel and brutal. So, this is um, a classic battle between the U.S. military and Native populations. It's one you'll hear referenced a lot. Um, so I would, it's going to be part of the Indian Wars. I'd encourage you to watch it. Okay. What about the challenges of social and economic change? Well, we have to think about the issue of slavery. Slavery is still happening. However, we see with the industrial revolution, a shift in the economy. Where are we making our money? And in Britain, especially as the economic motivation, the profitability of slavery doesn't, it starts to go down or rather the industrial revolution and manufacturing is so much more profitable that the economic incentives for slavery start to decrease. So you have the rise of abolitionists. Abolitionists are people who advocated for the abolition of slavery. So they want to get rid of slavery. After the independence of South American countries, the international Atlantic slave trade stops. But the demand for labor will slow the abolition of slavery. So in the U.S., slavery will be abolished after the American Civil War, but African Americans will still live in harsh conditions. Despite slavery being illegal in the Constitution, many other laws are passed in states to keep African Americans disenfranchised, to keep them out of economic prosperity, to um, keep them from education, from careers, from building up inherited wealth, Jim Crow laws, segregation, redlining, all of this will be not, um, or rather, will be allowed um, under the Constitution, under the um, Supreme Court decision that upholds separate but equal is constitutional, and thus African Americans will be kept Um, poor and out of power, very purposefully. In Brazil, slavery will last until 1888. Brazil is going to be our last state to get rid of slavery and to stop importing slaves from Africa. In the Caribbean, the Haitian Revolution convinces plantation owners that a loss of a colonial government would unleash chaos. So slaves tried to rebel on various islands but won't be successful. Britain will stop the slave trade in 1807 and use their navy to enforce it, but it won't really end until 1838. France abolishes slavery in the Caribbean in 1848 with one of their revolutions. The Dutch colonies end slavery in 1863, and slavery will last the longest in our Spanish colonies of Cuba and Puerto Rico. Okay, with all of this, you have huge amounts of migrants. During the colonial period, most of our migrants to the Americas are going to be African slaves, forced migration. After the colonial period, with these states being independent, you see millions of Europeans and Asians migrating. And think back to Ravenstein's laws of migration last year. What's the number one reason why people migrate? Economics, right? So they're seeking a better life. Who's going to migrate? Well, predominantly single young men, right? They're traveling by themselves um, and then they'll bring their families over later. Where are they migrating to? Well, if they're going long distances, in this case they are, they will go to economic centers, our largest cities, Buenos Aires, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, Sao Paulo, Mexico City. So 
European immigrants will avoid regions that relied on slavery, in part because there's going to be less economic opportunity for them there. Tens of thousands of immigrants from China and India will come to South America with indentured servant contracts. In um, European migrants will go predominantly to the United States, Argentina, and Brazil. So that's why if you listen to like the Argentine um, Spanish accent, you can hear some Italian in it. There is a huge Italian and British population in Argentina. From Asia, you see our migrants going predominantly to Peru, Canada, and the American West Coast. So the railroads in the West will be built by the Chinese. India sends half a million migrants to the Caribbean. British Guiana gets over 200,000 indentured servants. Why? Well, the British have outlawed slavery. However, they still need laborers for their plantations in the Caribbean. Well, by this point, they have colonized India as well. And so you have within the British Commonwealth, this movement of people between different British colonies. One of the things we will see emerging as a result of all of this migration is this attitude of nativism. Nativism is going to be this belief that our country, our culture is best and that foreigners are a threat. So the question is, how do you integrate these immigrants who speak different languages, who have different religions, different values? How do you integrate them into your dominant culture? Immigrants in general will be viewed as undesirable. Europeans will be greater, um, will be liked better than Asians, but even within, among the European migrants, you have a hierarchy, right? British and German migrants will be welcomed more than Irish, Italian, or Russian migrants. In the U.S., you will have anti-Chinese riots, and in 1883, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Canada, Peru, Mexico, and Cuba also all have anti-Chinese prejudice as well. Japanese migrants to Brazil and Indians to former British colonies will face similar prejudices. So European migrants will face prejudice as well. Italians will be viewed as criminals and anarchists, violent and li uh, they are violent and liars. Spanish migrants will be viewed as cheap and dishonest. Jewish migrants are fleeing um, pogroms in Russia, which are, you know, they're, they're fleeing persecution, they're fleeing murder and discrimination. And they get to the Americas and they face persecution or they face discrimination. Ita Irish, German, Swedish, Polish, and Middle Eastern migrants are viewed as well um, with suspicion. In general, this is across the board, right? I, I can think of a lot of examples from the United States, simply because my knowledge base is wider there. But in all of our new American nations, migrants are viewed with suspicion. They are viewed as being a threat to native born workers because migrants will accept lower wages, right? So if you're part of a labor union and you are trying to build up um, safer working conditions, higher wages, shorter hours, and you go on strike and the factory owner can say, fine, you're all fired. I'm hiring all of these Italian workers who will work for half of what I was paying you. It completely undermines your ability to negotiate. Migrants will also be viewed as a threat to national culture because they'll resist assimilation, right? A lot of times the attitude will be like, fine, you can come and be part of our country, but you know, learn English or learn Spanish, be Catholic, be Protestant, um, eat what we eat, 
dress like we dress, assimilates to our culture. And when migrant cultures don't want to do that, when they want to keep their native religion, language, customs, it's frustrating. It's viewed as a threat. So you have this sort of intellectual response. Can this mix of people, can a mix of people that have so many different cultures and values sustain common citizenship? So schools, as public education becomes a thing, it emphasizes assimilation, language, cultural values, patriotic attitudes. So let's talk a little bit about American cultures at this time. In Latin America, you have this tension between European influence and the desire to create a uniquely American identity. Elites will adopt the tastes and fashion of Europe. Popular writing, uh, popular culture changes very little. It stays very traditional. So history, writing, and political commentary would often go together. And social change will become will come very slowly to Indians, Blacks, and women. You have to understand that when we talk about Latin America, the dominant, the elite culture in Chile and Argentina is very European. Like Canada and the United States, they genocided their indigenous populations and repopulated out of European migrants. And yet, despite this tension um, between Europe and creating a unique American culture, you see the influence of immigrants on these newly forming cultures. Immigrants altered the politics of many of the hemisphere's nations as they sought to influence government policies. So immigrant groups would create ethnically based mutual aid societies, sports and leisure clubs, neighborhoods, you know, little Italy, and they will provide valuable social and economic support to new migrants, and they'll contribute to the growth of your national economy. So immigrants will acculturate, right? Um, Assimilation is when you give up your culture and wholeheartedly adopt a new culture. Acculturation is when you mix the two. So the languages, arts, music, and political cultures of the Western Hemisphere will be influenced by the cultures of the immigrants who come into them. Words, phrases, um, terminology, um, syntax, will be uh, will influence American English, Argentine Spanish, and Brazilian Portuguese. You have diverse diets. You have a mixing of musical traditions. Many immigrants wanted to, once they sort of got their footing, were in favor of labor reform. They wanted to improve working conditions. And European migrants were coming from an environment in which labor unions and sort of socialist movements had already been underway. So they'll help form new political movements and help new arrivals integrate. What about women? Well, women will actively participate in all of our independence movements and experience very little political benefit. So in 1848, you have your first sort of women's rights convention known as the Seneca Falls Convention in Seneca, New York. It's a gathering of women angered by their exclusion from international abolitionism, right? Some of our strongest abolitionists are going to be women. And there's this big international convention um, and women, these female abolitionists, who have been working so hard, who have dedicated their lives, are like, great, I want to go. And all of the dudes are like, Haha, no. So they have their own convention. They discuss women's rights in general. They, um, It's our first sort of formal step towards a feminist movement. Women could participate in public education, right? Women 
were allowed to be educated. Um, girls were learning how to read. Um, and so this is going to create new opportunities for women. Women's rights movements will make slow progress towards the achievement of economic, legal, political, and educational equality in the Americas in general. And the important thing to remember is that most working class women are not participating in this. This first wave feminism, which is going to have almost all of its emphasis on suffrage, the right to vote, is going to be very much a middle class and upper class movement. Yet, despite it being a middle class and upper class movement, working class women will be forced to take jobs outside the home due to economic circumstances and thus contribute to the transformation of gender relations as they push unintentionally push the boundaries of this cult of domesticity. What about Blacks in the Americas, right? Not just African Americans in the United States, but former slaves across the American colonies. Well, despite the abolition of slavery, various forms of discrimination against people of African descent remained. Attempts to overturn racist stereotypes and uh, to celebrate Black cultural achievements in political and literary magazines will fail to end ethnic and racial discrimination. Latin America is going to be more accepting of mixed race people. Um, and again, this goes all the way back to our first formation of the colonies, right? How from the get-go in our Latin American colonies, you had um, much more mixing of the races, Whereas in our British colonies, it was much more segregated, right? From the get-go, you didn't have white colonists really spending time with indigenous populations or black populations. Whereas in the Latin American colonies, you had lots of intermarrying, intermixing. And so mixed race um, people will be able to have more success in Latin America than in the United States. Okay, I want you to think back to human geography. What is development? When I say, oh, this is a developing country, this is a developed country, what do I mean? What is Wallerstein's, I know it says Wallen, Wallerstein's world systems theory? And what is the core and what is the periphery when we talk about economics? So let's talk about economics in this system. Well, one of the challenges is how do you confront the socio-political problems that already existed and the way there's, they are gonna change as the Americas start to, start to industrialize. Our early leaders are very idealistic, right? They're, off, their ideas are often very egalitarian. If you look at the language of their writings and of these constitutions, it's all about, you know, equality under the law. All men are created equal. But these ideas are not really acted upon or enacted. Early constitutions are often short-lived. I mean, even in the United States, the Articles of Confederation did not exist for more than like a decade before we wrote the constitution that we have today. We see that attempts at consolidation and unification fail because of regionalism, but it's not just because of regionalism, right? There's also geographic barriers and distances. Like, sure, having a, um, you know, Gran Colombia with its capital in Bogota would be awesome, but you have the Andes Mountains um, isolating Peru and Ecuador from Colombia and Venezuela. You don't have effective communication across long distances. You have poor infrastructure of roads, trains, transportation, and then of course you have your different regional interests and political divides. So 
Latin American independence is a lot like if the South won the Civil War. The landed elites were in charge of everything. These oligarchs, also known as cadillos, have sort of fiefdoms, and that's all they really care about, is their land. They aren't invested in the idea of a nation, so they are going to make decisions that will benefit them as individuals in the short term economically, even if in the long term it is bad for the economics of their new nation. Indigenous peoples have no say in the political system. They're functioning in the same way as black sharecroppers in the United States, forced to work in these systems. Even if they are technically not slaves, their quality of life has not improved. So these oligarchs, these cadillos, will sell land to foreign companies. Nearly half of Nicaragua will be owned by American banana companies. And indigenous populations will be brought down from the mountains at gunpoint to harvest the crops. Right, These indigenous populations were forced into the mountains in the first place because the higher quality land was taken by force from them. Brazilian and Caribbean sugar plantations were the center of Latin American economies and trade with Europe. For Mexico, it's copper and silver, Argentina, beef, Cuba, tobacco, Brazil, coffee, the British will really invest in infrastructure in Argentina so they can get beef to the UK. So they own all the railroads. In Chile, Europe will want to own the desert because that's where the mining is, right? Copper, nitrates for industry. And these Chilean oligarchs, Claudios, think like, sure, I'm not making money off the desert. Yeah, I'll sell it to you. And so all of this natural wealth will go straight to Europe and none of it will go to the new Chilean government. Whereas if Chile was doing this mining, then they could sell the goods to Europe and make a profit. Between 1880 and 1920, Latin America will experience tremendous spurts of economic and urban growth. The liberal ideology of the open market and limited government intervention in the economy really triumphs. Immigrants from Europe, India, China, and Africa will come to Argentina and Brazil to fill the labor needs on plantations and haciendas. Predominantly, these will be male migrants. Steamships and railroads will provide improved communication and transportation of goods. But the dangers for Latin American economics are many. Latin American ports open them up to global trade, which introduce foreign goods to the region. And so they become really dependent on the importation of foreign goods and the exportation of raw materials to European markets, as well as foreign loans. Foreign investments will provide capital and services, but will constrain governments from social commercial and diplomatic policies that might be good for their populations, but bad for Europe or the United States. Foreign entrepreneurs and bankers, predominantly again, European and American, will enter Latin America and control whole industries, banks, transportation and um, infrastructure, and locals will be pushed out. When we, oh, I said this. When we think about industrialization, the United States is really the only one to industrialize it in a big way. The United States, Canada, and Argentina will all eventually attain living standards similar to those in Western Europe. And these nations share three things in common, open land, diverse resources, and a large influx of immigrants. The rising demand for mine products will lead to mining booms in the Western United States, Mexico and Chile, heavily capitalized European and North American corporations will play a significant role in developing mining enterprises in Latin America. And thus the expense of transportation and communication technology um, will also 
increased dependence on foreign capital, right? These Latin American countries don't have the money to build up their own infrastructure. And these foreign companies will say, we'll do it for, you know, a fee for, it will loan you the money. We want control of this industry. So you see on the global market, Latin America, the United States, and Canada will all participate in an increasingly integrated global market. But interdependence and competition will produce deep structural differences. The nations who industrialized achieved prosperity and development, while the nations that depended on the exportation of raw materials and low-wage industries will experience underdevelopment, right? So the United States, Canada, and Argentina will really become part of the core, right? Um, the United States and Canada predominantly. Um, so they are importing raw materials and exporting um, finished products, whereas our periphery countries will be most of the rest of Latin America, whose economy is going to be really based upon exporting raw materials and then buying the finished products. Cyclical swings in the international markets will partially explain why Canada and the U.S. achieve development while Latin America will remain underdeveloped. Both the U.S. and Canada got independence during periods of global economic expansion, whereas Latin American countries got independence during global economic contraction, right, when the economy globally was shrinking. Weak governments, political instabilities, and in some cases, civil war will also slow Latin American development. Latin America will become increasingly dependent on Britain and then later the United States for technology and capital. All right, what about the environmental impact of all of this? Well, population growth, economic expansion, and the introduction of new plants and animals will bring about deforestation, soil exhaustion, and erosion. Rapid urbanization will put strain on water delivery systems, sewage and garbage disposal systems, and the spread and will lead to the spread of the timber industry. The expansion of mining will lead to erosion and pollution in the western U.S., Chile, and Brazil. Faced with the choice between protecting the environment or achieving economic growth, all of the Western Hemisphere will choose economic growth. So um, this is a great video, just explains how the Panama Canal works. Before we jump into our practice questions, I just want to add a few concluding thoughts. All of our new nations in the Western Hemisphere will really draw heavily on their colonial political traditions. All but the U.S. will suffer failed constitutions within a generation and were really divided by distinct regions and ideologies. These new nations will face foreign intervention and or regional competition over territory. The end of slavery in the U.S. and Brazil um, followed long campaigns and protests to the point of civil war. The poorest regions in the U.S. and Brazil were those that relied on slave labor. In the Americas, overall, indigenous populations will be forced onto marginal lands and will remain at the bottom economically. Immigrants tended to settle in regions that had not included slavery. Many will come as indentured servants and some such as Asians and um, East Indians, those from India, will experience racial discrimination. Apart from the U.S., which was a major industrial power by 1890, the rest of the Western Hemisphere will really remain heavily dependent on agricultural exports. Okay, let's look at these practice questions. Pause the video and look at the source. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, what became the focus of the reform movement that initiated this passage? The 
This declaration can be best understood in the context of The concepts outlined in the first part of this passage were previously used in the late 18th century as an argument for so for your summary i'd like you to explain the causes and effects of calls for change in industrial society and explain how industrialization caused changes in existing social hierarchies and standards of living thanks for listening if you have any questions please ask have a great day